Hi, my name is Alexis Matson. I am an OT student working for the American Stroke Foundation this summer for my level 2B field work from Creighton University. I am from Alaska, and so I will be giving tips on touring my home state, Alaska. An overview of what I'll be discussing. I have a fun game, true or false trivia at the very beginning. I will talk about my family in Alaska, places to visit when you do go touring, wildlife and safety tips, both on the land and ocean, and weather and preparation. This picture on the right is actually of Denali or Mount McKinley as it was formerly known. Um, a personal picture that I took from an airplane on my way to Fairbanks, Alaska. So uh, this was over spring break of 2020, just right after COVID hit, and we had to get all of our stuff back from college. So that was a, a not super fun trip, but a very beautiful sight to see. And so I love talking about my home state and making sure that people know how beautiful it is. For this true or false Alaska trivia, it might be helpful if you want to pause the video. In between my pauses, I will take a minute to say the sentence, true or false, and then you can pause it if you're in a group, you can talk about it, you can debate, it can be really fun. Um, or if you're by yourself, even the same thing, you can pause the video to think. And then I will continue to the answer. So when I take a pause, be sure to pause the video yourself. True or false, Alaska is termed as the last frontier in the land of the midnight sun. This is an example where you can pause the video to think about it. This statement is true. Alaska is termed as the last frontier and the land of the midnight sun. And it is true that it does not get dark in the summer. It does get very dark in the winter. Um, but it does get very, very light in the summer. The sun does technically set, but it also gets very dusky instead of dark. It never gets pitch black or anywhere near it. True or false, Alaska has about 2,000 rivers and 1 million lakes. This answer is false. Alaska has about 3,000 rivers and 1 million lakes. Sorry, 3 million lakes. True or false? Most U.S. glaciers are in Alaska. This answer is true. Most U.S. glaciers are in Alaska. True or false? Alaska's state flag was designed by a 13-year-old. This statement is true. Alaska's state flag was designed by a 13-year-old. His name was Benny Benson. And I believe it was a school project that he actually turned this in for. It is a very simple design as shown to the right. It's just of what we call the Big Dipper and the North Star. It is very representative of, representative of our state. Very simplistic, but very symbolic. I love our flag. I love our state. True or false, Fairbanks can get to below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. This statement is true, it can get to below negative, de negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and it has actually gotten to the negative 60s in the past. And what will happen is college students that attend the University of Alaska Fairbanks will go out in swimsuits and take pictures with the negative degrees sign when it gets to be crazy, crazy below zero, and it's a very fun tradition for those students. True or false? It always snows in Alaska. This is false. It does not always snow in Alaska. I would assume that in some places there is always snow, but it doesn't mean that it is constantly snowing. Um, there might be some on mountaintops somewhere very, very far north where it's very cold. But I will say every mountain that I see in the summer does tend to melt to make it very bare, so no snow. True or false, giant vegetables are common in Alaska. This answer is true, and it could be debated whether it's common in Alaska, but every year at the state fair, we have a competition to see what farmer can grow the biggest squash, cabbage, pumpkin, and there's a whole bunch of world records set from Alaska and the amazingly huge vegetables and fruits that we grow. True or false, 
Alaska is the second largest state behind Texas. So Texas is the largest and Alaska is the second largest state. This answer is false. And the next diagram will show just how big Alaska is. I know in most maps, they tend to have Alaska over to the west a little bit near California. We are actually located very much north of that and we are very much bigger than it depicts. So you can see how Michigan over to the right of the Alaska design is very small in comparison. So it's very cool to see this picture and see just how big our state is. So I'm gonna talk about my family in Alaska. I have on the left, me and my roommate, we are at B Victory Bible Camp and the mountain directly behind us, we call the Dr. Seuss Mountain. I have no idea what it's actually called, but it is very, very beautiful over there. And it is the most serene place I think I have been so far. On the right, that's my fiance, Ryan. We are on the Kanik River and there's a bridge on that river. There is a tradition for seniors to take photos, senior photos on this river. It is a very, be very beautiful place to be. Um, and you can see the mountain range behind it and the mountains to the side. It's a very nice place for a picnic. So in this picture on the left, I have my dad, my brother, me and my mom. And on the right, I have my stepdad and me. So on the far left picture, this is on the way to Seward, uh, Seward, Alaska, which I'll talk about later. There's a very beautiful train that goes all the way from Seward to Anchorage and all the way from Anchorage to Denali. I recommend taking the train if you possibly can. The middle picture is of our state fair. Every fall we have our state fair and it is a hit. You can find our giant vegetables there. On the very far right, that is the town of Whittier. It is a very beautiful place to go, very rainy often. The only way into this city is through a tunnel that you have to take one way. So it's a one-way tunnel and it's scheduled. So if you miss the tunnel, you have to wait about half an hour to an hour to wait for the other people to get through. So it's a very beautiful town, but the only way to get in is a tunnel or a boat. I'll talk about some places to visit, specific um, cities and towns that's very nice to go and places to go there and things to do there. My hometown is Wasilla. I love everything about Wasilla. You can see that beautiful mountain range behind uh, what is right there is actually a target. And we've got uh, the hometown of Sarah Palin right here. Um, I have never met her, for those that are curious, but um, I do live um, in this, I lived in this town. It's such a beautiful town. Very small, but it's growing because of Sarah Palin and people are moving from Anchorage, which I'll talk about next, to Wasilla because it is such a growing town. So in Anchorage, this is the biggest, both in population and geographically, town in Alaska. You can see, again, the beautiful mountain ranges behind. Um, that's about as big as our city gets. Um, and we've got a huge, huge center for downtown events. In the summer, we've got farmer's markets. And um, in the winters, we've got the Iditarod running through here. And it also runs through Wasilla. And we've got Iron Dog in Wasilla, which is a snow machining, or if you call it snowmobiling race. Um, there are some very fun things to do in Anchorage, maybe even some cruises that go out from here. Um, I recommend taking the train from Anchorage to Seward, which we will talk about later. Juneau is located a little bit more east, so it is more towards Seattle than Anchorage is. And Juneau is the home of our capital with most of the politicians. So if you're into politics, history, I recommend going to Juneau. Um, the place that is for city people is probably Anchorage, but for historians, it's Juneau. It is right next to the ocean. It's a beautiful place to go. It kind of reminds me personally of Portland, but I also am from Alaska, so I don't know if that's a fair estimate. It has amazing walkways that you can walk to different little stores. It's very cute. 
And then Fairbanks is the home to University of Alaska Fairbanks, which is up north about 350 miles from Wasilla. And Wasilla um, has a college close by, University of Alaska Anchorage in Anchorage, but Fairbanks was the first developed college in Alaska. This town gets freezing in the winter and very, very hot in the summer. So if you're looking for a place to go that is very hot in the summer, so 90s or higher, that is your place. There also is Chena Hot Springs, which is around this area. Um, you'll find that with a quick Google search and it is very popular. You can rent cabins there. You can rent ca cabins on a river in Fairbanks. There's a lot of different places to go here as well. Homer is uh, I keep saying beautiful, but that's my state. It's a beautiful town. It's got a nice um, exit, sort of. It's a man-made, we call it the spit, man-made land. Um, this picture is of the spit. People go camping on here. There's little small businesses on there. It's a perfect place if you've got family and kids, and even if you're just going somewhere with your spouse um, or even alone. There's really good clam chowder here. I recommend the clam chowder. And there's a lot of halibut fishing out of here. So if you want to go fishing for those really huge flat brown fish, that would be for Homer. And you can talk about cruise lines or tours, and they're very good about guiding you to the right people so that you can get done what you want. Um, also, a little bit further away from the spit in the main town of Homer as you're entering, there's some beautiful cabins that look out on the ocean from the very top part of Homer. So very nice place to go. Seward is very much like Homer in the way that it's very popular for camping. I hear now that you have to reserve camping spots here. Um, it's very nice for people that like to go walking, like to go shopping, get some tourist gifts or Alaskan ice cream. There's also a lot of marine tours through here, as you can see the, the middle building in this picture. You get to see the ocean. You get to see cruise lines go out every night as you're sitting by a fire. And it's a very cute little setup of camping spots. And if you get really lucky, you get one right by the ocean, right next to that sidewalk that spans from these buildings all the way to the Alaska Sea Center through the camping ground in the Alaska Sea Center is an amazing place to go if you want to look at animals, but maybe not go on the ocean for real. Um, they've got uh, teacher discounts and a lot of availability for tickets. And you can see sea otters, sea lions, puffins. They used to have um, seals. I'm not sure if they have seals anymore, but they've got great things going on. They rescue animals and make sure that they're taken care of, and they temporarily stay at the Sea Life Center there in Seward. And also the first place gold medalist um, from Alaska is Lydia Jacoby in the 100 meter breaststroke from the Olympics this last year. Her hometown is Seward, so if any swimmer fans out there might want to go check out Seward. Kodiak is a little bit more south. It truly is just an island. I say it's just an island, but if you're a hiker, there are amazing hikes. You can go traveling on roads and go on little tiny walks. There's a bunch of docks and boats where people park their boats. You can walk on those docks any time of day. There's cute little coffee shops you can sit at if it ever gets too cold. In the summer, it really does not get that cold, um, but maybe to some people it does. It's about high 60s to 70s and since it's next to the ocean the breeze might be a little chilly but just bring the right clothes and you'll be fine. So talking about common Alaskan animals on the land. So on the left we have some grizzly bears in the fall and on the right there are three moose, a mom and two babies outside of Bartlett High School in Anchorage. So there are moose everywhere and I will talk more about that. So for animal safety on land, caribou are normally not aggressive. The males are more aggressive than females, especially during mating season, but they don't tend to chase you down. Um, but they definitely should still have a distance between you and them. If they feel like they are being harmed because they are an animal that is prey, not a predator, they will likely not 
approach you, but fight if provoked. And the fact is domesticated caribou are reindeer. So there's a reindeer farm in Palmer, Alaska, if you're interested in that. That is just caribou on a farm, so we call them reindeer. And on the left, you can see how the antlers are shedding um, the velvet on the outside. And it is bleeding, but it is a part of normal life. It's like how a snake molts. Um, it's like his molting season. And so every, I believe it's summer, their velvet comes off to reveal their antlers. And it's, um, if you ever see one and you're worried about it, that's just a natural way that they go about life. Moose are more likely to be aggressive. They are known to attack dogs if you are not careful, so please keep your dogs close. Um, they will not provoke, but if they are provoked, then they will provoke as well. So moose are more likely to be aggressive. Some of the warning signs are stomping, raised hair like a cat, or lifting his head like a horse, and keep your distance from it. And I, when I say distance, I mean over 100 feet or more. Um, I really feel like a lot of people say there's a really good distance from you to your spouse. The distance that you're comfortable with with that is very much di different than the distance that you need between yourself and a wild animal. Um, so uh, if you do go to Alaska, please just respect these animals. And as you're driving, you do have to watch out for them, just as you might watch out for deer or other small animals. These can get to be about 1,800 pounds as a grown male. So they do a lot more damage to cars. So just watch out, turn your lights on if you're driving in the dark, just be mindful. And really all you have to be is mindful and you'll be okay. And only males have antlers. We call those bulls. Red fox, those are beautiful little sneaky animals. They are not normally rabid, but they should not come up to you or that is a sign of them being rabid, especially obviously if they're foaming at the mouth, if they're being violent, acting violent. Um, they should normally run from you, but if you allow them to be, it will be fine. Um, I just don't recommend coming up to a fox that comes up to you. You should be prepared to make sure that animal stays away from you. And a fact, they hunt with stealth and pouncing. If you look up the Arctic fox, there is a million videos on these cute little arctic foxes stealthily finding their way to their prey, hearing them under the snow, and pouncing down to get them. The black bear. So there's the black bear, polar bear, and brown bear, or the grizzly. It's also termed, I'll talk about the black bear first. This is a bear that's about a human's size, if not just slightly bigger. Um, do not play dead, you need to fight back. Um, this is the one that black bears, you need to make sure that you're fighting back because you are their size. So if you happen to accidentally get too close, you accidentally get between a mama and its cubs, it's maybe going to fight you. It's not common at all. Just make sure that you're being very careful around them. Keep your distance. Do not make any sudden movements. Use bear spray only if a bear is quickly approaching. People think that bear spray is good to spray on like bug repellent. It actually attracts the bears um, because it's similar to pepper spray and bears eat human food. So it smells like human food and that's not good to have. So on hikes, you can use sound makers. Um, so little bells around your ankles. You can talk with a friend, clack some sticks. Just make sure that they know that you're there and they'll try to leave you alone. They are the most adaptable bear to live in human areas. So one of the biggest things is if you do go camping, if you do go anywhere out, just make sure that you put your trash away because it is unlikely that you'll see this uh, bear often in cities or anything like that. Even camping, it's rare to see them, but it's a lot less rare when people tend to leave their food out. The brown bear, it's also called the grizzly, you should play dead. So this one is bigger than the, uh, the, than the black bear. So you have to play dead for this one. You have to protect your head, your neck, your body, uh, the main part of your body, your trunk. And if for whatever reason it does attack you, you're in a bad situation, pretend that you're dead, block your head, 
but then if it does not let up, then that's when you should fight. Again, this really is not common. Take precautions, again, like making sure that you're making noise when you are hiking. Do not make any sudden movements. Stay away from its the mama and the cubs because the males are aggressive, but the moms are afraid of um, people or other things harming their babies. So make sure to stay away from that. Some of the warning signs of grizzly bears are chomping of the jaw. So it'll sound like a jaw popping and puffing like a horse. Um, you can look up some videos of this so that you can know if you can't see the bear, but you hear the bear, then you know you're a little bit in danger. One thing about bears is I do not recommend climbing trees if you're ever stuck in a situation with them because they can also climb the trees. So that's kind of a fact that I heard in my bio class in high school that I did not know. In Kodiak, there is a subspecies of grizzly bear that is recognized as the largest subspecies of grizzly standing at 10 feet tall. So basically the bears on Kodiak Island, like I was saying earlier, it's an island off everything else, nothing's around it. And the grizzly bears that happen to be there started creating their own subspecies just by natural selection, all of those things. And they have formed to be 10 feet tall, which is ginormous. Polar bears, they are the top of the food chain, but they are mainly in the Arctic circle. They rarely attack humans unless provoked. The amount of humans that are actually in the same territory as polar bears are very limited. So a lot of the Alaska native cultures are still up in the Arctic Circle all around Alaska. There's a very respected uh, native Alaskan population that we have that do continue to live their lives of subsistence of where their ancestors and elders live. And so they're more likely to be around that than you are. But then again, all of their ice is melting, so they are coming inward, and in the next couple decades, they are assuming that the polar bear will either be extinct or they will come more inland and survive off of that. So it's not likely right now, but it may be in the future. And their skin is actually black. Their hair is white, but their skin is black, and that works with the light and the sun to keep in heat and make sure that they are staying warm. So some of the common Alaskan animals in the ocean, I'll cover some of my favorites and some of them that you really need to watch out for. Orcas and killer whales, they will not hurt you on purpose. However, keep your eyes out when boating because if you see a pod of them, you'll see their uh, black fins, dorsal fins coming out of the water. You'll see them breaching. Um, they will not attack you. However, they will not um, you need to watch out for them more than they're watching out for you. They will notice that you're there and maybe stay away. Some of them are interested and will come over, but the breaching ones are dangerous because if you're in a smaller boat, it's not the best situation if they breach, especially with the water waves that result from that. Just don't pet them. If they happen to come up to your boat, don't try to reel it in. Don't try to put bait out for it because it will come up next to your boat and it can capsize if it accidentally hits your boat. So they're not actually unsafe to humans necessarily. They just can be unsafe if you are in the wrong position. And they actually can vocalize according to their different pods. So it's like different languages in each of their pods. They're, they have different cultures. They speak different languages. It's a really cool, really cool situation that they've got. And then humpback whales. Again, keep an eye out when boating. These are known to breach, so they eat krill. They're not, um, they don't eat bigger mammals, but breaching can be dangerous to smaller boats and even normal ocean boats. So if you're on a cruise, perfectly safe. The worst thing that can happen is honestly, the cruise hits the whale, but they're very good about getting out of the way, honestly. Um, but if you are in a small boat, if a friend says they really want to take some kayaks out, Maybe go along the coast and don't go out to the main ocean where a lot of these are because it can be pretty dangerous when they breach. And um, yeah, because they're huge creatures and they respect you. They won't hurt you, but they also go about their lives and eat krill, which makes them go up and breach to eat the krill. 
Some populations swim 5,000 miles between feeding and bre breeding grounds. So a lot of them come to Alaska for feeding, and then they move all the way back down to California, to, ha to Hawaii for their breeding grounds, um, and to give birth to their babies. So feeding and breeding are very different. They need hot and cold and hot for the babies to be born. And yeah, it's a very, if you look up how the migration patterns work, it's very interesting if you're into biology. I love porpoises. They are a subspecies slash species of dolphin. They're in the same family. It's like a cousin. They will race your boat if you are in a cruise ship, if you were in a, honestly, even a kayak, I'm sure they would do this. I have been in ocean boats before where they will race your boat. And so just be mindful of where you are and where they are. Make sure that they're not going to get caught in any of your fishing nets or poles or anything like that. They are very kind animals. And honestly, I have seen them do nothing but have fun. So it's very interesting and neat to see them and honestly, even hang out with them on the ocean. It's very cool. They can swim at 55 miles an hour, so I feel like that's part of why they like to race. Puffins, this is more for their safety than yours. Just watch out for hooks and boats. Don't hit them, don't touch them, don't pet them. They are very beautiful creatures and majestic looking as they are. Um, there are some in the Alaska Sea Life Center if you don't like to go out into the ocean. If you do go like go out to the ocean, you'll see them a lot on rocky parts of the terrain. So out in the middle of the ocean where you start to see big, I guess, mountains slash hills of rocks and they like to perch on those and dive um, for their fish and they can dive to almost 200 feet or 60 meters underwater. Sea lions are <laughs> majestic, ginormous creatures. They do have a history, and I have experienced this firsthand. Uh, my grandfather actually hooked a sea lion on accident because it saw the bait and wanted the bait on his fishing hook. And so if that happens, you'll likely be with a guide or a person from the state who knows. So just act accordingly. Make sure that you're not intentionally trying to hook these guys because that is very much illegal. Um, but if it's an accident, they eat it, that's an accident, and just make sure that you're really not trying to attack them. And they don't usually attack humans. If um, you happen to come on a an island that has a bunch of them on the beach, which you will see them on the beach, um, they may become aggressive over their territory or offspring in that circumstance. So just be mindful. If you see a whole bunch of them, maybe don't approach them. Males can weigh up to 2,500 pounds, which tells you how big these creatures are. Rockfish. I love fishing for these. This picture is of a yellow eye. My opinion is they're the least difficult fish to catch. With all that I'm about to say, please keep in mind this is Alaska, and my opinions are what I have grown up with in Alaska with our subsistence <laughs> subsistence fishing, but they are the least difficult to catch because they live at the bottom, hence their name rockfish. They, if they come up too fast, it's kind of like the bends in humans, it's the same for them. They will either pass out or die often. So you, I mean, they're not really able to fight you back when you bring them in, but at the same time, they have poisonous spines, so don't touch them, especially if they're still alive when they come to the top. Just be very careful because there are a lot of people that touch these that have just the spines that get really bad infections and really dangerous situations because of that. So just be mindful of their spines, especially when you're filleting them. Be sure to research how to fillet them and look at the diagrams, talk to your tour guide, do all of those things so that you are ensuring your safety, but they are very delicious as well. And they can grow up to three feet long. So this one is pretty big. I'd say it's about that long. Salmon, there are so many different kinds of salmon. I would say in my, well, I would say in my favorite, my favorite is the red salmon. And a fact is they are considered by the general population the best for canning and smoking. My grandma loves to can with jalapenos, so that is very fun. 
Um, you need to watch for salmon con conservation signs and laws before fishing. Anytime you go out fishing, you need a license if you're above a certain age. I believe that age has changed. So just be mindful. Go to the local state trooper office and they will issue you a fishing license. And um, yeah, <laughs> so watch your head. I say watch your head because when you bring these fish in, they do not have the bends of sorts. They are very much alive and very much active. And we've had fish actually jump back out of our boat. Um, just make sure, and honestly, the most humane thing is to knock them out before you gill them, which means that you um, cut their gills so that they bleed out for um, their meat to taste better later on when you put it in the freezer. Again, this is Alaska, so it is a little bit um, gory to some people, but this is just our way of life. Um, so again, they are very active, so you might need to knock them out. Um, the best way to do that is fast and very strong because if you just start hitting it and you aren't sure about it, then that is considered inhumane. And um, I'm actually an advocate to make sure that we do not do that. So hit it once, hit it hard, hit it fast right on its head. It will be knocked out, not feel a thing. Um, and the funny story of that is my little brother was fishing with us as a family and we caught a silver, a huge silver. He was trying to knock it out, but instead he was a couple years old, so not very strong. He didn't knock it out in time and it whacked him in the head with his tail because these fish are strong. There are a whole bunch of different kinds. And I heard that pinks are not good, but with these as well, if you go dip netting in Kenai, a lot of the time, I'll kind of use my pointer here, on the tail you have to cut on the corners every time you catch a fish because that lets the troopers know that you are counting, you are aware of what you're doing, and it's actually, if they catch you without a fish with its tails, uh, tail ends cut, you can get huge fines. The halibut, the most popular outside of the salmon fish, you can see how it's very flat. They are on the bottom of the ocean. They can get up to 459 pounds. That's the highest on record. Um, they are so big sometimes that you may have to use a gun to shoot it before you bring it in the boat. A lot of the time, if you are an amateur fisherman, you will not catch a fish this big. You will catch smaller ones that are more like flounders. But if you happen to be on a big touring line or something like that, they may be more prone to catching these bigger creatures. Um, a lot of the, as you can see, these guys are pretty seasoned fishermen they have a lot more ability to catch these. So salmon, you can go dip netting and you can go um, with just a fishing rod, just casting out in rivers. Again, please make sure that you're watching out for the laws and signs. Um, but for the halibut, you're going to the bottom of the ocean to get them. So you need a very heavy weight. You need a lot of patience and a lot of strength to bring it back up. So just being mindful of those things and letting your tour guide know of any health issues or concerns about this because they can help you bring it in and they're very good about that. Sea otters, they are my favorite. They can be aggressive only if provoked. So they, they can hurt you and can hurt you very badly if you are getting in their space, but they will not attack you ever. Don't hit them with your boat. Watch out where you're going. You'll see little logs in the ocean and then you'll see little otters and just make sure that you're watching and looking to make sure that you are not hitting, well, you shouldn't hit logs anyway because that is very bad for your boat, but just watch out for those things because both logs and otters are not good to hit. And a fun fact, they will hold hands with each other and uh, hold hands with other otters so that they will not float away, as you see in this picture. So some emergencies, weather, and safety. I'll talk about earthquakes. This picture on the left was actually Vine Road from the 2018 7.0 earthquake. I'll talk more about that and the tsunami warnings and what you do. For earthquake safety, you should drop, cover, and hold on. So get under a chair. If you cannot find a table, get under a desk. Make sure you are away from glass. Make sure that you are covering your head, your neck, and kneeling down to the ground. 
Um, you're not on your hands and knees, you are crouched down. Um, I would say hold on to that table leg, hold on to that chair leg uh, with one hand and protect with the other, just so that you don't move away from the table. Because the 7.0 that I experienced felt like my house was on stilts. I could only find my table, which had a very small space, but it was right next to a window. So that was the best circumstance I could find. You just really need to get down and you need to get down fast. Block your head, block your eyes if there is glass around you. Watch for falling objects. They say that you should go into a door frame that has been proven and unproven to be helpful. Um, I would not recommend it if you had a choice between a door frame and a table. 100% please take the table. Um, these earthquakes are, they're likely to happen in Alaska. You can feel them, but the 7.0 earthquake was a one time in my 20 years of living in Alaska. It really is not common at all for that to happen. So just be mindful that there might be one, know what to do if there is one, and don't freak out if there's a small one, but just listen for aftershocks as well, like feel for aftershocks. Um, if there is a really, really bad one, please just keep staying for a few minutes afterwards, and I mean a few minutes afterwards because there can and will be aftershocks if it was a big one. So for tsunami safety, a lot of the time you can see a sudden rise or fall in the ocean's uh, levels, so it might pull back really far, or you can see the actual wave coming. You can hear a loud roar from the ocean, so it kind of gives you a warning, um, and you can feel a strong or long earthquake around or near that. You will also get texts about tsunami warnings, um, tsunami watches. If um, you're in the area, a lot of times they'll text your phone, and they will tell you that there was an earthquake in, say, Japan, just to be on the lookout, listen for local local warnings, local attention to that situation. Just make sure that you're being mindful of your surroundings. I believe every every day at noon in Seward, there is the test of the tsunami warning system. If you happen to hear the sirens outside and it is noon, it is likely that, especially if you did not get a text with it, if other Alaskans are not freaking out, it is just a test. So if it's noon, if it's on the top of the hour, most of the time, it is just a test. If it is 4.52 and you hear it, that's a very different circumstance and you need to get to high ground and get there fast. I do not recommend driving because you will and can get caught in traffic and then you are stuck in your car. So just make sure that you know where you're going to go. Uh, just kind of do a quick little look around, look at the mountains, see how you're going to get there. Um, and they do give out warnings enough to make sure people are safe. In the absolute worst circumstance, people are very, very careful and watchful about tsunamis. We have not had one. Again, that's knock on wood as far as I know, um, but it's just a really good safety thing to have because we are, um, a lot of the towns that I talked about are on the coast. For the weather, make sure you're wearing layers and so if it's very, very hot, you might want to have a tank top, maybe even a light jacket. Um, I wouldn't really wear a hat if it's super hot, but maybe have uh, something like that around because if it does happen to get cold, you should have something. But if it gets very, very cold, like in this picture, negative 43 degrees, after it gets to the negative 15, my opinion is that the air bites. So it feels like a bunch of bites all over your body. Make sure everything is covered. Make sure everything, so, and covered, not just covered, it's warm, insulated. You're wearing layers. I would wear a pair of leggings or um, under, under layer clothing. That's good for cold weather. On top or underneath another layer of snow pants or a jacket or of some kind like that. Um, if you are driving in the winter, make sure you have a first aid kit, make sure you have a blanket and matches and a whole bunch of things that you can be safe in case your car does break down and for whatever reason you're lost or no one can find you um, because this weather is not a joke. Make sure it's wool socks, um, bring those little pocket warmers, but most of the time a lot of people um, 
there's going to be people around. They're going to help you. If you are in that circumstance, they will help you. Um, but just make sure that you're being mindful. And if you're going somewhere, let somebody know um, and have them keep in check with you. Keep up with the news and weather forecast again if it gets to negatives. If you have too tight of gloves on too, uh, this is a side note, or gloves or shoes or jackets, it can hurt your circulation. So if I had, for instance, a pair of boots that were too tight, it would not actually allow the blood to get to my toes, let alone keep them warm. So that can allow for frostbite to happen quicker. And so just make sure that your clothes are fitting correctly. And that when you try on boots, you make sure that they fit with the socks you're planning to wear. Because I have done that where I've put on my little tiny socks that I wear every single day, but I was planning to wear wool socks with that. So just be mindful. Um, in winter, there's snow. Uh, with the cars, with the driving, it is dangerous at times, especially in South Central. It will snow, melt, and then freeze into ice sheets, and it will have freezing rain. We will have a bunch of sleet on the ground, and just be really mindful of your car as in um, four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive. If it's not, then, and you only have two, then make sure you are just being very careful, and um, yeah, just be very careful when you're going around, and watch for warnings. There's not a whole lot of warnings. Just make sure that you're staying on top of it and being safe. Water safety. As a past lifeguard, past swimmer, swim coach, I really recommend that you wear life jackets. Whether you're going on a lake, whether you're standing, uh, going on a river, a lot of people do some kayaking and stuff like that. Please wear a life jacket. As a swimmer, I will say, Michael Phelps, the best Olympian of all time. If he is knocked unconscious, he cannot swim either. So a lot of the times, life jackets are a huge deal between life and death in the situations that really get dire. A lot of the time, they may seem uncomfortable. They may seem annoying, but they can be the line between life and death. And um, you can see a good fit on the left on that picture over there and a bad fit. So that little boy in the good fit, he's able to be picked up by his dad, by the shoulders of his life jacket. So if you just tug, they should go up to your ears maybe, but um, it should not go above your head. So on the right side, the bad fit shows him not being picked up by it. So if he were to jump into the water, it would be likely that his life jacket would just fly on off. So he will not, he might as well not be wearing a life jacket. Boat sober, do not drink and drive. Do not drink and boat. And that is not a joke either. Um, anytime you're using any machinery, I recommend. I believe it's even a law to do it sober. However, boating in Alaska, whether it's in the ocean, whether it's in a lake, on a river, there are likely people around you and a lot of them. If you are on the river, ocean, whatever, they are likely to be out there as well. If you are intoxicated, high, or even you're just so exhausted, you are having a hard time staying awake. That can be also very dangerous, and you can have very, very bad things happen. Be aware of your surroundings. Look around you. See where you've been. Have a GPS. Have a tour guide. Um, just make sure that if you're swimming, you're watching out for boats. You're watching out for those jet skis. If you're on a lake, make sure that you're just not walking into rivers. Rivers can sweep you away if they're even six inches um, deep. So just be very careful. <laughs> None of this, and I say this as an honest truth, all of the things I'm talking about are really unlikely. But in the case that they do happen, it is very important to remember these things and to do these things because while they are rare or while they are not common, they can happen, and the reason I'm giving this is to make sure that you go and enjoy safely. So then you can watch the forecast for water safety. There are tide um, schedules even that tells you when the tide will be what and where, and there are ways that you can tell what the swells will be like that day, which is the uh, big waves in the ocean. If the swells are too big, if there are storms, it is very dangerous 
at times to go on the ocean. Um, we went boating in a riverboat on the ocean, also something that's not great, where you, it was over 15 feet how big these falls were, and it was not meant for our boat. So we read the schedule wrong, and we needed to get back in and get back fast before the situation got dire. So just really be careful because the forecast can and will dictate how your day goes and whether or not uh, danger is going to happen. And if you're going to go swimming, swim with a buddy. Don't swim in a river. You can swim in a lake for sure. There's not anything that will bite, hurt, or do anything to you other than swimmer's itch, but just make sure that you're swimming with a buddy. Even three people is the best, so one person can stay with the person and another one can leave um, to go get help but just make sure that there's someone with you and you're not just doing stuff alone. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that I didn't scare you off of Alaska because it really is beautiful. Again, all of these things are super uncommon. It really is not likely, but I really recommend taking these precautions to make sure that your trip, if you decide to take one, is the most fun that it can possibly be. Thank you so much and I hope to see you in Alaska.